I, I feel like I almost have to talk with an Australian accent and say, good day, mate, or however it might be. Hey, I'm back. And uh, I, I didn't really go far because we were here talking about the digs trade like less than a week ago, and it's always game day in Buffalo. Uh, but now back here and digesting it all. I did miss the eclipse, though, Matt Bove. How was it? It was really cool. I thought it was overblown for a while, but to be here yeah. for it and just all of a sudden in the middle of the day, it just get pitch black outside and all the automatic lights turn on was really something that I probably will never forget. But when you said you didn't go very far, I was like, no, Sal, you quite literally went about <laughs> as far as you can go across the globe, even though we did record a podcast from you in Brisbane. Yes, we did. Now I am back. It was a very long flight back, 14 hours from Brisbane to Vancouver, another four from Vancouver to Toronto. I missed a whole day. It was beautiful out in Buffalo, but we're back in the saddle. We're ready to talk about the draft. We're ready to talk about how the Buffalo Bills put the pieces together in the post Stefan Diggs era and here to do it with us today. And it's always game day in Buffalo is our good friend Faraz Siddiqui of Upper Hand Fantasy. Faraz, thanks for doing this today, man. We really appreciate it. Of course, of course. I'm excited to talk Bills. There's a lot going on, you know. D- Diggs being traded while you are on vacation, man, oh and God. and you know that that's a that's a that's a crazy thing to happen while Sal is on vacation. Okay, first of all, like the Bills need to wait till Sal's back. Okay. Yes, I yeah, I agree with so. that. But you know, this is the business we're in. We always had Matt and I had great stories. We'd actually did an episode one time where we talked about the things that happen while. You know, we're just doing our life because this is the business we're in, right? You do too. I mean, something happens while you're somewhere doing something. For example, literally driving to my anniversary dinner with my wife and I get an alert that Tyrod Taylor was traded. Literally walking into a tux and pucks game for the Sabres, wearing a tux, New Year's Eve, get an alert that Doug Marone opted out of his deal and the Bills need a new coach. And the next day, New Year's Day, it's time to go to work. I mean, I'm sure you have stories like that too for us. (laughs) <laughs> that's absolutely insane man yeah of course you know i'm with my kids at the park i got to you know, do a quick instagram story and i'm doing it all the time my, my you know my family's used to it at this point you know what i mean i i, I try not to abandon them you know as much as i do when these stories yeah. break the problem is that you know for fantasy especially during the fantasy season all of these you know crazy things are happening you know with you know with guys getting hurt who to pick up all that kind of stuff that breaking news is so important to get out so quickly otherwise you know news is during the season you know news can be you know uh really pressing one minute and then a couple of hours later like there's no point in even talking about it right because things move right. so quickly no doubt about it uh, before we begin i want to ask either of you okay have you ever heard of a kookaburro no no idea no, I'm going to say no, Sal. It sounds familiar, but no, I'm going to say no. Okay. I had never heard of a kookaburro until I heard a kookaburro while in Australia. Woke up to one of the most interesting sounds I'd ever heard in my life. I want you, when we're done here, to go and re- you can do, do this. You can go find and play something online of a sound of a kookaburro. It sounds something like the early morning when the sun rises. Okay. It sounds, I, I'm not kidding, something like this. <laughs> and it's amazing and it terrified the living crap out of me but it was also the most amazing sound i've ever heard and i'm like that was cool that's so like how many times have many you drinks <laughs> <laughs> have you practiced that cell i thought that was that was pretty good like i don't know what it, what what it actually sounds like but i kind of want it to sound like that all right, well, listen, I also think that it might have sounded like that when the Bills traded Stefan Diggs here back in Buffalo. Matt, you were here for it. Yeah. I was in Australia, and uh, there was a lot of fallout from that. Real quick, before we get into um, the receivers and Faraz, Matt, uh, latest thing is the, mm-hmm. uh, the the tweet that he liked. Does it change your perspective on anything um, from Stefan Diggs? And he liked a tweet, basically someone saying, Bills have the worst fan base because look at all these people in the comments, and he liked it. It's a breakup. This is not to be unexpected. First off, he was the most cryptic man on social media that's ever played for a Buffalo sports organization. So no, this should not surprise anybody at this point. They broke up. It is a very public breakup. You go through every single stage of this. Right now, he's probably pissed off. He's probably like, listen, I was the best receiver that team has had in 20 years. They don't acknowledge me. It's like Roman Reigns, WrestleMania. Stefan Diggs wants to be acknowledged. And nobody's saying anything to him. So no, I don't think that this is a surprise. I don't think that it should change anything. This is just life with Stefan Diggs. And now it's life after Stefan Diggs here in Buffalo. For us, from a football standpoint, before we get into the fantasy part and before we get into the draft part from a football standpoint are you with a a lot of the national media who feel the bills are kind of taking a step back here this year they're kind of resetting and maybe it might be a year where they have to wait or do you feel like a lot of people here in buffalo say like look they're still fine they still have a really talented roster and of course they have josh allen 
they have a talented roster. They still have Josh Allen. I do think that a lot of people are downplaying this downplaying this offense um, a little bit too far because you know when Josh Allen's your quarterback, you can make a lot happen out of nothing. And when you look at how the Bills, you know, towards the second half of the season when Joe Brady came in and took over. Stephon Diggs, you know, while he was on the field and he was dictating a lot of coverage, he wasn't necessarily overused, right? He wasn't necessarily somebody that they had to depend on. Now, obviously, when Diggs is on the field, double coverage and a lot of coverage going his way, which which obviously helps the offense immensely, even if he wasn't getting the ball on a particular play. Uh, but I do think that, uh, you know, with they have it, they have a very interesting draft position here yes. right at the end of the first round where they can go a lot of different directions in terms of which wide receiver they end up going now if they don't go wide receiver at that pick you know then you, you got to start thinking about all right what are they really going to be doing they really have to try and hit you know later on in the draft if they can uh but i do think that listen you know, they. I really, really like the Curtis Samuel signing. I think that was an underrated signing. Now, is he a an ex receiver? You know, kind of replacing what Stephon Diggs can do. Of course not. But I think he's a very, very good complementary piece. Obviously, you have um, a very good slot receiver in Khalil Shakir as well. I think. I think a lot of people might be overrating Khalil Shakir, even though I was a huge fan of Shakir coming in, watching him at the Senior Bowl, and then him coming in. I think he he has some more left on the table there in terms of what he could do for this offense. But I do still think they are missing that number one wide receiver on this offense. Now, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. We're two weeks away, right? As we've gotten closer to the draft, I am almost expecting a trade-up. Like, I really do not think the Bills are going to take a receiver 28. Now, there's two layers to this, though. Do they trade all the way up and try and get into the top 10 and do like a Julio Jones type trade? Or do they make a smaller trade up to try and lock in a guy like a Brian Thomas Jr. or like an A.D. Mitchell? So I know there's a lot of different ways we could go, but I want to start with the top three guys. Just from your vantage point, how good are they? Because all some or all offseason, it's like the big three, the big three, the big three. How good are they? And do you have any kind of tiers within that own tier of itself yeah i, I they are really good okay th this top three you know i'm not going to say anything wild here and say that you know one of these top three don't deserve to be in the top three i think they are all in one tier if i had to split it up it would probably be 1A with Marvin Harrison and Malik Neighbors in that 1A tier, and then that 1B tier, probably Roma Dunze, right? And, and I think the main difference between those two tiers is that the first two guys I mentioned, they have very, very good production profile, produ production and efficiency profiles to go along with what you're seeing on tape. But then when you watch Roma Dunze and his route running at his size and his contested catch ability, you know, on film, you know, it, it's it's um, it, it for me personally, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up being the the most valuable wide receiver in a couple of years out of these three. Um, but the production profile, the efficiency profile, they're not as good as those other guys. And, and that's the only knock that I see there uh, for Roma Dunze. And on top of that, a little bit lesser competition in terms of you know who he went up against right also, See, yeah, let, me, did, let me ask you this for us when you say you think you know he he could be one of being the best one is that because he has a more complete game like what do yes. you love about him versus the other guys not when you say that's so funny because it's not like you don't like the other guys you love them too right but what would what would maybe if let's say he has at the end of the day 10 years from now we're like man adunze had the best career why would he have the best career i, I think he is probably the most refined route runner uh among the three uh, number one, number two, the contested catch ability is probably the best among the three. Um, and he also has after the catch ability um, as a true X receiver. Can you say that Malik Neighbors can be a true X receiver in the NFL? Maybe, right? Justin Jefferson was able to prove that wrong coming out of the come uh, coming out of LSU, running out of the slot, and then you know playing on the outside at an extremely you know uh, productive pace, right? And, and and now you have something similar with Malik Neighbors having to prove the same thing now. I think in the samples that we've seen of him running on the outside as a perimeter wide receiver, he had no problems against man coverage, right? He's a very explosive. He's, he has a very uh, amazing release package. Um, and, you know, top of his routes are extremely clean, but I think Odunze, you know, has, uh, you know, at his size, size, speed, you know, contested catchability, he kind of has the entire package. 
couple different things with trade up partners. First off, do you think it would be a good idea? Like, because the teams that I'm circling right now for the Bills, if Brandon Bean decides to, you know, lose it and trade all the way up into the top 10, the Giants at six and the Bears at nine. The Giants at six, I think, happens for a couple. I don't think it happens. I'm saying if it does happen, it's because there's a run on quarterbacks and they want to try and move back to get more ammunition to eventually make a trade up for a quarterback maybe next year. For the Bears, they've only got four picks. So it's like, oh, okay, do we have enough holes that we need to try and recoup assets? Do you think it would be smart to move all the way up and give up two ones in a second to go do that? Or do you think the class is good enough that you should wait for a little bit and see if one of those other guys can kind of fall t- closer to you? You know, it really depends on how sure of a thing that you want, right? And I think you mentioned two particular guys, A.D. Mitchell and Brian Thomas Jr., who both – while you look at what they can do, they're extremely promising, but are they sure things? And and I say the answer to that question is no, um, especially Brian Thomas, where he, I, in my opinion, needs a little bit more development to become that true X receiver. Can he become a, a C, uh, is he already a very, very good field stretcher um, at his size, at his speed? Yes. Contested catch rate, all that stuff is there. A.D. Mitchell, I think, is a little bit more of a complete receiver although the production profile is extremely limited, just like Brian Thomas. You don't have those type of questions with those top three guys, right? So if you want that, if you want to go in and show everybody, you know, that, you know, in the Bills community that, hey, we're going to replace Stefan Diggs right here, it's one of those three guys, right? So if you're going to be trading up into the top six to potentially grab a Malik neighbors, if you're going to be draft going into the top 10, maybe a little bit later at nine, you know, before the Jets pick, if Roma Dunze is there, right? I think, that is worth it, right? Because you're going to be drafting that next top wide receiver. Because listen, like everybody's talking about the Bills, like it has their Super Bowl window been shut now that Stefan Diggs is out, now that a lot of these other veterans that have been cap casualties are out. You add a Romo Dunze there, they're back. Faraz Siddiqui joining us here on It's Always Game Day in Buffalo. And, um, we had, let's, um, let's, let's take a pause here for a second and then let's talk on the other side about what it would take and whether or not it would be worth it because I have a comparable that we've talked about a lot. For us, thanks for joining us here and it's always game day in Buffalo. We really appreciate it. Sal Capaccio, Matt Bove. All right. There's one, we, we talk about moving that far up, but come on to do that. It would cost so much draft capital. We have a template for this though, for us 2011 Julio Jones, the Atlanta Falcons, they go from 27 to six, right? If, I'm sorry. Was it four? So I have to go up and look, look at it was, where did they go? Uh, sixth overall, sixth overall. And they gave up so much. Let me just go back. And it was five draft picks, including 27 overall. Their first rounder the following year. That was a two. There was a four in there. I mean, that's what it would cost. Because this draft is so flush with wide receivers, is it worth it, even if you're going to get one of those top three to do something like that? You know, I, 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 I'm looking at a couple of these wide receivers later on in the first draft, right? Like, you, uh, first round, I'm sorry. You look at those two guys that we mentioned, right? There are other guys who are potentially safer. Like, I look at someone like Ladd McConkey, uh, yeah. you know, who you could potentially even trade down a couple picks and still grab. Like, maybe, you know, grab, like, that extra pick, you know, later in later rounds um, and grabbing McConkey maybe at the top of the second. Right. If he's still there, if the Chiefs don't grab him. Right. Um, you know, now that the Chiefs got Marquise Brown, like, do they go wide receiver in, in, you know, with that first pick? I don't know if they do. If they didn't have Hollywood, then I'm a little worried there. Right. Then maybe I stay put and reach for someone like McConkey. I think he's one of the safest wide receivers in this draft. In my opinion, I think he's one of the best route runners. Um, and while he might not play that X receiver role, I think he could play the flanker role. And we've seen Diggs transition from that X receiver role playing on the line on every play for the, over the last couple of years, he transitioned out of that a little bit, right? More than 50% of his routes have been off the line, right? Running as that Z, you know, as that flanker. So, and I think McConkey can kind of come in, play that role. That's the role I kind of see Curtis Samuel playing, to be honest with you, that flanker Z, you know, maybe switching up with uh Khalil Shakir a little bit for slot, you know, outside. Um, but, I think McConkie is somebody who can come in um, and be good enough where Josh Allen can elevate this entire group. 
you know, he kind of showed his hand a little bit, Lad McConkey saying that he has met with the Bills multiple times. I, most of the guys have, but he said it on, I believe, the Kay Adams show that he's already met with them multiple times. So we know there's interest there. I, when we're recording this, it sounds like Troy Franklin is in town for a visit. I'm sure that they've had conversations with Keon Coleman, Xavier, like the list goes on. But are there any other players that you think would be a really good fit for the Bills if they do ultimately stay at 28? Yeah, I think if they do end up staying now, the guy I don't want them to grab is Keon Coleman, to be honest with you. And, you know, I, I, I'm a positive guy, right? I like He's talking polarizing guy. He's polarizing guy. He is. He is extremely polarizing. Um, But, you know, I, I do think that he, you know, you have someone like Stefan Diggs, you want to replace someone like that who's really good separator, right? One of the best route runners in the NFL. And, you know, with somebody who doesn't necessarily separate with the best of them and is more of a contested catch, non-separating wide receiver, in my opinion, whereas someone like A.D. Mitchell can come in and be that guy, right? I'm not convinced that A.D. Mitchell is going to be drafted early on. Now, his NFL Combine performance definitely is going to attract a lot more teams than maybe than he, he, he than they would have. But, like, at this point... I'm looking at someone like him who could potentially be there. If he's not there, then I do think Lad McConkey, uh, you know, would be that guy. Now, Troy Franklin and Xavier Worthy, they also don't fit that X receiver type of guy, right? Like the fact that they signed, uh, the fact that they ended up going out in free agency and and grabbing Curtis Samuel, that to me, and also remember like that there's a big connection between Curtis Samuel and Joe Brady, right? He had his best year under Joe Brady several years ago. I think he plays that role. So I do think that they're going to go out and try to get that separating receiver who could play the X. Well, I'm also thinking about guys like Xavier Leggett, a guy like Ricky Pearsall. There are, there's so much value a little bit later. I love Xavier Leggett. I think that's a guy, you look at his backstory too, where he came from. He kind of screams Bill's DNA. Everything this kid ever had, he had to work really hard for it, coming from where he came from. And Ricky Pearsall, another guy from Florida, right? These are guys that, Man, if, if you want to trade up, you're giving up capital that costs you to take them a little bit later where I really don't. Now, look, Brandon Bean joked on the Pat McAfee show, you're going to take a receiver every every pick. I don't think that, but I don't think it's off the table. They take a couple in the first few picks. Now, I do like, you know, later on, like I do like, like Xavier Leggett is so, I think he's even more polarizing than, uh, than some of the other guys you mentioned, like Keon Coleman, because it's so rare for a fifth year breakout. Yeah. to end up, you know, being successful in the NFL. Now, can he be the guy who, you know, kind of like is is the exception to the rule? Yes, I, I, potentially. You know, I, I saw him firsthand at the Senior Bowl as well. He, you know, first day of practice, you know, not amazing, but like he really bounced back in days two and three at practice. I think, you know, at his build, at his size, he could definitely be, uh, be that guy. Another guy, Tez Walker, right? He's another guy who is a field-stretching receiver, who might have a little bit more upside than Brian Thomas Jr. If he can put it all together, I think that he can be end up being a more complete receiver. And I think that's what the bills are looking for. Now, if you go even further down the line, let's say that they, they uh, don't end up grabbing that X receiver. You mentioned Ricky Pierce, Pierce all. I think he falls into that slot receiver, right? You know, with Roman Wilson, but then you have someone like Javon Baker, right? Yes. Johnny, Johnny Wilson. I was literally just um, going to ask you about Javon Baker. Good, good. I think Javon Baker is yeah. one of those guys who is going probably one of the most overlooked receivers in this draft class mm -hmm. who might end up being a round four guy, right? When it's all said and done. And I think round four receivers, you know what? They don't really pan out a whole lot, right? Well, the like Bills took one in round four from the same school. Yeah, there you go. A pretty <laughs> good job from the last four years right. of Gabe Davis. These are the exceptions to the rule. You know, even, you know, Gabe Davis, you know, it, you know, if you ask me, like he was a solid receiver, right? And I think Bills fans are going to be happy with what they have replaced him with, to be honest with you. And and I think moving forward, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, you, you mentioned those guys. I think Javon Baker can step in as an X receiver. If you look at the pr production profile, efficiency profile of Javon Baker, also, you know, in the power five, right? It's not like he, he, he played outside the power five or anything like that. He, Looking pretty good. Yards per route run, all the all the metrics that you want to see is there. Um, and, and the film is there as well. He was there at the senior bowl too. So I, I I think he's somebody that the Bills should, you know, be targeting um, you know, later on, even if they do end up taking a wide receiver early on. Sal, do you have any other or any other wide receiver questions? Because I do have one fantasy question that I want to ask. Um, I, I want to look at the top of the draft. I think that if you look at where it falls, and Matt was talking about, you know, where to get to. Right now, I think the Bears are still very much. Yeah, I know they traded for Keenan Allen. 
they very much they were very much in on Gabe Davis. I know that as well. I still I think they're going to try and load up to help out Caleb Williams, who's presumably the number one pick. That's got to be the spot if you want to get Roma Dunze. I think that's the spot. He doesn't doesn't go f- further than nine. So you tell me how you think it plays out up there. Like, where are these guys going? How quickly will they come off the board? Given what we're probably going to see at the top of the board at quarterback, and then the flush wide receiver group, obviously. I I can see him moving past the bear. The, the fact that they brought in Keenan Allen. Okay. Now, w- is this going to end up being a one year thing with Keenan Allen potentially? Um, right. Will they end up bringing in? Uh, if I were the Bears, yes, I, I think I would try and bring in Roma Dunes and try to help him out. I think they do still need some offensive line help. They need some help, you know, outside of the offensive skill positions. Um, you know, on that defense as well. So I, I think there are some holes to fill that the Bears might end up moving towards. Um, I think I like the idea of drafting that young wide receiver to pair with Odunze, but the fact that they have DJ Moore, Cole Komet, DeAndre Swift, and you know, and and Keenan Allen, you know, that's that that's enough for Caleb Williams to succeed early on in his career. Um, I think the Bears might even be the team that you trade with, right? Because if you think that the Bears are going to draft a wide receiver, you want to trade, you want to end up getting ahead of them, right, in the draft. And I think the Jets, you know, at 10 is the team that will definitely be taking Rumble Dunes if he's available. So I don't think he's going to move past 10. So I think there's a potential that he slides past nine and, you know, and ends up going to the Jets. And, you know, what better way? To take Roma Dunze than trading, you know. Listen, I'm 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 a Jets fan. I'm gonna admit ah. on this on this podcast. Okay, <laughs> it is what it is. Okay, you guys didn't know that I'm dropping bombs right now. You know, on this, <laughs> yeah. on this show. <laughs> but uh, you know, Brock, I, Brock Bowers, I think that's the guy a lot of Jets fans wanted. Is that is that kind of a spot you think? Let's say Dunze is gone. If um, Dunze is gone, Bowers. If Odunze is gone, you know, I, I would love to take an offensive lineman, you know, to be honest with you, to try to really go all in. Like, will Brock Bowers, you know, be that guy to, you know, uh, make a huge impact in year one? Maybe, you know, like w- tight ends are, you know, you never know when they're going to make right. an impact. It could take a couple of years, right? Dalton Kincaid, you know, was, you know, an exception. Like last year's class was an exception to the rule with these tight end, rookie tight ends just making a huge impact. Um, I, I don't think that's going to happen all the time, even with Brock Bowers being one of the best prospects at the position that we've seen in a long time. Is this my fantasy question is, is it as simple in dynasty drafts as the top three receivers or the top three picks? And then whoever the bills take is the fourth pick. Does that feel how it's going to go? <laughs> that's that's kind of how it feels like it's going to go, man. I, I really do. I, I think, you know, the top three picks for sure, right? And that guy, and then probably Bob Brock Bowers after that, right? I think that's that's kind of yeah. the order it's going to go in. All right. Okay. Um, Interesting. Fi- fi- final thing from me before we let you go here, we really appreciate your time. Where does J.J. McCarthy get drafted? I think he's going to slip all the way down to the Vikings. I don't think the Vikings are going to have to trade up. Um, I think that as teams continue to evaluate, I, I don't think the Giants, I think the Giants would be the team that the Vikings would have to worry about. And if I had to guess here, I don't think the Giants make that move. I think the Giants end up drafting Malik Neighbors mm-hmm. at five. Interesting. I think, no, at six, I think at six. And then I think um, the Vikings can stay put where they're at and end up drafting JJ. It's you, you. You think the first three picks are quarterbacks, though, right? I I, I do. I do. I th- I think it's going to be. You know. I think the. I think the Commanders are. You know. It it would be. It would be. Very much in the cards for the Vikings to trade up into the top three, right? Because of that extra first rounder that yep. they just they just grabbed. Like it seems like they're scheming up something. There's yep. no guarantee that's going to happen, right? And I think if those top three teams really really like the quarterbacks that they're about to draft. Like, I, I just don't see that happening, Switch, in which case, like, okay, now do you hop in front of the Giants, right? And that's, right. that's, I, I, I'm not sure that the Giants are going to be happy taking J.J. McCarthy at five, at six, I'm sorry. All right, uh, Matt, you got anything else before we let Faraz go? No, just tell everybody where they can follow your stuff, hear you, read you, all that kind of stuff as we get ready for the draft. Yeah, we we you know upper hand fantasy. Uh, you know as you know we have the upper hand fantasy podcast uh, yep. also in the Odyssey family, uh, and uh, upper hand fantasy on Instagram is probably the best place where we put out most of our content, where most of our community uh, is active. I know you're in Jersey. I know you said you're a Jets fan. Are you a Yankees fan or a Mets fan? I'm a Mets fan. I'm a Mets fan. Come on, 
what what is going on here? The, I, I know I grew here, up Yankees, in, you know. I, listen, I grew up in Flushing, Queens. I okay? get it. I, you know, oh distance, yeah, you have to. You know, yeah, from you Chase oh, Stadium God. and City Field. So it was one of those things where you know Jets and Mets is, is is how we. You know, not not a great way to do it, to be honest with you. Okay, I, not hey, a great I way get it. Go. My my college roommate was from East Northport, New York, and was a big Mets fan. I was a Yankees fan. We're in college together, freshman year, Syracuse University. His name is Joe Scarola. Shout out to Joe. Nice Italian guy. And, you know, we, we, we have Yankees Mets four years, become really good friends. And after, after Syracuse, he gets a job in the Mets ticket office, low level, just wants to work. He's getting a job one day. It's a true story. One day, um, he late nineties, there's a phone call. His mom answers and goes, yeah, something now this is before cell phones and all that. And his mom goes, yeah, somebody says they're Bobby Valentine. Now he thought it was one of his buddies play, playing a trick on him. It was really Bobby Valentine. And he said, Hi, Joe. He said, uh, we need somebody in our video scouting department. And your your resume came across because you went to Syracuse and have video experience. So we took a job in the video scouting department. And now, 25 years later, my college roommate, Joe Scarola, is a vice president and runs the video scouting department for the New York Mets. So there you go. For, oh, for no I kidding. About that. that is so cool. <laughs> I love that. I love <laughs> well, that. That's a great story, right? I know. I so I know not having the start you want. The Yankees are in the meantime for us. Thank you so much. And we're going to, I'm sure hit you up at some point again before, after the draft, we'll break it all down, buddy. It's always good talking to you guys. All right. You got it. Thank, for you, us. Thank you very much. We're going to let you go. And Matt and I are going to talk a little more about the bills. Thanks a lot for us. Appreciate Braz it. Sadike from upper hand fantasy. All right. So Matt, the bills had a move after Stefan Diggs that we haven't really discussed. Mm -hmm. Bills brought in, Lay all Collins. This is a guy that if you remember years ago, he had a situation where he was going to be a first round pick. And then he, something happened. There was a legal situation where they didn't allow him to go to the draft or he didn't. So he did the supplemental draft. There was like this, all these teams, who's going to take them. And the Cowboys kind of snatched him up. Like, yeah, they added to that great offensive line. They had several years ago. And now he's on his third team after going to the Bengals. Now he'll be on the bills. A bit of a surprise to me, add for the Bills to get Leal Collins, who's a, a good lineman. They get him on a mm -hmm. deal that seems like they're going to be paying him some decent money here. But why do you think that they brought in a free agent offensive lineman here at this stage in the game, especially someone that's got some skin on the wall? It's interesting because I think he probably, now we don't know all the details of the contract yet, but the initial look at the contract feels like he's paid too well to just be a backup tackle, right? So then you're like, well, what are they doing? I definitely think he's their swing tackle, right? Like that's yep, not even a question, but is there a chance he plays guard? Is there a chance that they don't have David Edwards play guard and they have him try and play guard? Like, cause that's, I, a, I mean, it's, is it out of the realm of possibility? I think it's basically, he becomes your all versatile swing man, like a Ryan Bates. So yes, mm -hmm. I, you, do you mean start? I guess he could compete. Yeah, you want competition. There's, I would not take it off the table that he could wind up starting at guard. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they go into the season thinking he's going to be their starting guard. I think that's going to be David Edwards right now for what they think. Is it off the table? No. I think it becomes kind of your Ryan Bates, which is can pretty much mm -hmm. play any position. I guess not center. He's not really a center. Um, David Edwards can actually play center as well. But to me, that's what this is. But the reason why I think they did it, Matt, I'm trying to try follow the breadcrumbs here of what moves Brandon Bean has made before the draft. He has the trade for Stefan Diggs, trades him out, gets an extra mm -hmm. second round pick. Now I know they gave up a couple of picks, one this year, one next year. They get the extra second. They're loading up a little bit on some draft capital. If he want I, I if he wants to make a move up, a significant move up, we think it would cost next year's first. Well it's a lot easier to do that if you have an extra second next year. You know what else would happen? If you do that, you're void of some other draft picks where maybe you might earmark for getting a little depth. You saw a guy like Lael Collins. Now you kind of take care of that. You don't have to worry about getting depth in the draft and offensive line. I think it still screams to me. It goes back to maybe them still trying to do what they have to do to make sure they're not in a position where they can't move up in the draft and feel like we are okay to do this because we've set ourselves around the board. I really do think it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm almost anticipating that we're sitting in the draft room on draft night and all of a sudden the TV flips to the bills being on the clock. Like I'm just, so yep. maybe your point is valid that they just want to have everything else taken care of. So they can kind of just go all out and try and get a receiver. I don't necessarily know if they would be thinking that far ahead. 
just because you need to see how the draft actually falls. Like I even think back to the year that they drafted Josh when it sounded like they had a deal in place with the Broncos, but then Bradley Chubb falls and the Broncos yeah. don't make the move and then they start to scramble. So Brandon Bean could have, you know, productive conversations with Joe Shane or with Ryan Poles or with somebody in the top 10 and have kind of like the framework set. But if something weird happens, then that could all be kind of pushed to the back burner. So I don't know if you would be making moves to give yourself that flexibility. I think that you just kind of figure it out afterwards, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's what they did with Puna Ford last year. If you remember, Brandon Bean told us, after they signed Puna Ford, which was after the draft, he said, yeah, they were talking about it and they could have signed him before the draft, but they want to see how the draft played out. And like, you know what? Mm-hmm. There's a couple of D tackles we might like, but they didn't want to force themselves. They knew they had Puna Ford maybe right there in the back burner. And then they did it in this case. That's why I wonder why did they not wait? If they maybe, maybe, I mean, it could be because Leo Collins might have had offers. Of course that could be the case, but in this case, they didn't wait. They did it and they mm-hmm. kind of shorted it up beforehand. So I keep thinking they're doing things to kind of make sure that they feel really comfortable about not having to be without those picks where they maybe could get some extra depth along the way. I think it's fascinating though, because I th- still think it points a lot to a reasonable chance that they trade up in this draft. And I think they could really make a significant move up. What do you think is more likely a significant move up a small move to try and get one of those next two guys or that they stay put? What do you think is more likely uh- to happen? I think the most likely is a small move up because that's just what he's done. And I also Mm -hmm. think that as much as he might want to move up significantly, I think it's hard to do. I mean, the the cost could be so astronomical and there's other teams you're bidding with. I just think that the the ability to do it. So to to me, I'm I'm thinking Brandon Bean wants to do that. That's the most likely thing he wants to do. But I think the most Mm -hmm. likely thing he can do is a smaller move up. What was, as we wrap out this podcast, is there anything else Bills related that you would like to talk about? I don't think so. I could be missing something, but no, I don't think so. Yes, real quick. By the time people hear this, it could be probably the last time we're doing it. Workouts start on Monday. They're actually getting back to the facility and having their mm-hmm. first team workout. It's voluntary, but workouts start Monday. Mm-hmm. Just wanted to throw that out there so everybody knows what's going on. Yeah, we're getting close. We should be back at the facility a t- couple different times over the next yeah. few weeks. And then obviously the draft starts, which is fun. What was your favorite part of your trip? Um, there were so many great parts of it. I think maybe the favorite part might have been watching Max like hold a koala and feed and pet kangaroos and how awesome that was for him. Like to see that. Th- mm-hmm. That was cool. Like going to the Australian zoo where Steve Irwin worked like super cool. Um, That might've been it, but there were so many great things. There was one other thing I liked a lot, which was we went on a hike basically um, on this. It's called North point. Uh, Sadabrook, I think it's called. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Anyway, it was a really cool, like this gorge, you know, this beautiful walk. It was really cool to just go on that hike. That's awesome. That's awesome. Would you go back? Like, have you, now that you've done it, you're like, okay, like for me, I've always felt that way about a couple of places that I've traveled to that I'm very happy I've been there, but now I don't feel like I need to go back. Do you mm-hmm. feel like now that you've done it, you definitely want to go back and do more? Or you're like, well, now next time I do this big, you know, once in a lifetime trip, I would rather go somewhere else. I definitely want to go back. But the reason why is because we only did Brisbane because our friends live there. I want to go to Sydney mm-hmm. and Melbourne, or at least Sydney yeah. and see that. Now, if people don't realize, and I, I mean, you can look at a map and say, okay, but Australia is as, almost as big as the United States or the continental United States. If you go no from way. Brisbane, yes, really? Yes. It's, um, oh my God. I had no I idea. Know, right? Yeah. It's 2.9 million miles. United States is like three point something. So yeah. Um, and if you, wow. you, I actually did it. If you go take, go, go on Google and say, um, US, uh, Australia map over US and you could see it. But anyway, going from Sydney, I'm sorry, Brisbane to Sydney is the same as going from uh, Buffalo to New York City, essentially. Okay, so it's not an easy trip. How about this? This is how it gives you an idea of how far it is. Going from Brisbane to Perth is the same as going from Buffalo to LA. That's nuts. I I legitimately had no idea that Australia... I would have thought Australia was a third of the size of the continental US or even a fourth of the size, I would have never had any idea that it was that big. I've never been there. I've never been past Europe. 
So that's like the farthest out that I've been. It depends on which way you go, I guess, to say which way you pass. But no, we would like yeah. to. And by the way, the we were we were there with friends, so we have friends there. It makes it easier to say to go back. Twenty thirty two, Brisbane, where we were, is whole is having the Summer Olympics, which is really cool. Oh, were they already like doing a bunch of work, or is that yes. start later? They're already building really? stuff. They're bringing yeah. There's a new stadium going on. One thing to do some stuff and a uh, new subway sy- like station. And we see all this. It's a very modern city. Very you know when you go to some cities, you know how you go to some cities and the buildings are just newer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's mm-hmm. a very modern city. So had a great time. Really glad to be back. And um, we are going to be uh, seeing some in some way, shape, or form. You know, Bills players back at the facility next week, Matt. It's hard to believe. It's crazy. It's already here, and e- then the draft in a couple weeks. Yeah, it's like an incredible stretch of a few weeks now that we've kind of gone through the doldrums of the offseason. But now we've yeah. got workouts that start. We've got the draft. We've got a fun conversation with Mike North that yes. we have planned. We have the schedule release coming up. And then Woo-hoo. after that, it's all of the mandatory stuff that begins. So it's like just when you think that things are slowing down, we've pretty much gone through the slowest part of the NFL calendar except for – mid to mid June to mid July. That's when everything right. basically shuts down. Right after right after yeah. mandatory mini camp until training camp starts. Yep. Which that's is fine. That's when that's when we'll take a break. All right. Well we are not going to take a break talking about the Bills. We'll talk to you next time and that will be right around when the Bills report back for their first day of offseason workouts, which starts Monday, May 15th. Thanks a lot to Faraz Siddiqui from April, the Upper Hand April Fantasy. April 15th. April 15th. You what did I May. say? Oh, May. Thank you. April 15th, April 15th. Thank you for, for correcting me. Uh, thanks a lot to Faraz for joining us here. And of course, uh, to our producer, Mike Rabier. I'm Sal Capaccio. He's Matt Bove. And we'll talk to you next time. It's always game day, Buffalo.